Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we saw Samuel de Champlain found the settlement of Quebec, which of course will become what we know today as Quebec City, contained of course within the modern Canadian province of Quebec. Important stuff! However, in the summer of 1610, Samuel de Champlain learns that Henri IV, King of France, had been assassinated by a Catholic zealot who found that the king was a little too moderate in his views between the wars and conflicts and plain old disagreements uh, between Catholics and Huguenots, who are, of course, our French Protestants. Champlain had known the king at a very young age, and we don't exactly know why. Uh, the king had always supported him, been his benefactor, gave him a pension at a very young age. Champlain, in return, provided services to the king, at least entertaining stories at court, and was once a spy for him in New Spain. The often repeated rumor, of course, was that Champlain was an illegitimate child of the king. But in the very least, the king was a father figure to Champlain. And now he was gone. Now in his stead, his wife Marie de Medici would rule as queen regent of France until their son came of age. Of course, she would have heavily uh, Catholic-leaning influences upon her own family, of course, as well as foreign influences coming from the Italian peninsula and the Iberian powers. She quickly went about purging the royal court of Protestants. And this included Champlain's boss, the man who controlled the monopoly, had the rights and the titles to New France and the St. Lawrence, de Mont. And so Champlain, by the fall of 1610, hurried back to France. Their boat actually hit a sleeping whale on the way. His settlement of Quebec left with just 17 people uh, in population. And when he arrives back in France, he finds the court full of people trying to obtain this monopoly that de Mont had. There was lots of competition, lots of different factions. The main product of this monopoly, of course, would be the fur trade, but also uh, fish on the side. And this is when Champlain starts working his magic, putting together a coalition, something that could be salvaged from all the work he had put in over all these years into Quebec and New France in general. And as many coalitions at this time uh, consisted of, this is when Champlain finally decided to marry. And historians believe this was out of the politics required to rebuild this franchise. Now Champlain married into a very connected merchant family uh, to a young woman, very young woman, to a girl named Helene Boulle, who in 1610 was about 12 years old. Now this might be the number one thing that does not make Champlain a modern hero or a modern man. This is uh, far out of time, and even in his own time, this was seen as a bit much. As even in his marriage agreement, it said that two years would have to elapse before this marriage would be consummated. Just to remind you, Champlain would be anywhere from 43 to 37 at this point in time. So even if you go by the old adage, half your age plus seven, still doesn't work out. I'm not defending this. There's nothing, nothing more I can say other than what is. Boole's family, like many around Champlain, uh, at one point were Protestant and then switched back to Catholic. They were riding that edge between both religions and the benefits that they could provide both spiritually and financially. As we'd come to see in future years, this marriage was contentious at times, and for a large chunk of the time it was basically non-existent except on paper. And it's a sad thing that uh, women in this time were often used as just pawns in a family's larger business, tying business interests together through marriages. And so on this subject, we turn to the preeminent historian David Hackett Fisher, who says, Champlain was more than three times her age, and they had little in common. She was a young city-bred Parisian. He was a middle-aged, battle-scarred soldier and a seaman of modest provincial origins. And maybe to Champlain's credit, historians note that they never had children. They spent much of their time apart. There is no evidence they ever had a husband and wife relationship in the physical sense. On this subject, I'll continue with uh, David Hackett Fisher. They drew a veil of silence over their marriage, and we shall never know the secrets of their life together. But two facts were clear enough. Champlain was devoted to his young wife, but from a distance, and Aline Boulle was deeply unhappy. And so this is a sad story. It, it, and it, at times it seems a little better, other times it's going to seem a little worse every time I bring up Helene. But for large chunks, like I said, Champlain wasn't there, and he always provided 
tons of money for Helene's living expenses. These first two years of their marriage, of course, she still lived with her family because she was 12. However, before Champlain could finalize some sort of plan on the French end for keeping this enterprise alive, he decided to rush back to Quebec. He sensed things might be falling apart. He goes back to Quebec in the spring of 1611. And to give you a sense of how early in the year he decided to do this, uh, his ship had to fight through fields of icebergs in order to do it. Now remember, towards the end of our last episode, he had just got done battling the Iroquois for the second time right before he left. And so as native wars go, there's always uh, retribution. So some part of his mind, and this is my own speculation, was probably thinking about uh, wondering if the Iroquois were going to raid into the St. Lawrence. Unknown to Champlain at the time, the Iroquois weren't coming back to the St. Lawrence anytime soon, either because of Champlain and his native allies or because of the uh, Dutch presence now on the Hudson that provided easy access to European goods. When Champlain got to Quebec, he began working on an alliance with the Huron. He realized some time ago that the Innu were the end of the supply chain as far as furs were concerned. And buying from them, the Innu had a monopoly and they were able to control prices. But further back in the chain were the Huron. And so if the, he could cut out the Innu, the middleman was gone. Of course, the Innu would still have their vast territory to pull furs from, but he could get to those thick furs from the inside of the, the cold North American continent from the Huron. He meets with the Huron in June of 1611, and that's where they exchange young men to work as uh, interpreters. Champlain receives a Huron that he names Savignon, and then Champlain gives to the Huron the young Antony Bruel. This guy will become very important. And he's been at Quebec City for two or three years now. He might have been in the original crew who uh, settled in 1608. But Antony Bruel will take to the native culture very quickly. And he's going to keep popping up in our story. Because he's going to live a, a, an interesting life full of adventures that he never wrote down. We only get little hints of it. And talk about big accomplishments. He only really ran into the Huron while he was clearing land on the future site of what would be Montreal. That's when the Hurons show up, and they're excited to see Samuel de Champlain, because Quebec had been overrun by private French merchant adventurers, young men looking to be like Champlain and make it in the fur trade. So, of course, Champlain hurried to Quebec City, and they were all gone by the time he got there, his reputation preceding them. But this hits to the real, the real reason why Champlain rushed back to Quebec City several months before this. There was no monopoly. Anyone uh, was allowed to trade in the St. Lawrence. There was no... French law saying this particular outfit or that one would prevail. Anyone who could trade furs and bring them back to France, well, that was open game. But Champlain was still able to maintain uh, a working fur trade operation out of the St. Lawrence because of the relationships he had already created with the natives. In fact, around 1610, 1611, the Innu reassured Champlain about these other traders. They reportedly said, There are women who only wish to make war on our beavers. And so Champlain, doing the most he could in the situation given, made his preliminary lines with the Huron. He uh, touched base with the Innu while also working to try to get around them. He had successfully chased the other traders out of his uh, settlement just by threatening to show up. And he also cleared some ground on the future side of Montreal. A pretty big accomplishment for just a fraction of, the, of a year. And then he hurried back in 1611 to France because, of course, he had to rebuild this end of it. As I mentioned in our last episode on Champlain, he's a bit of a plate spinner, right? Everything is, is going well, or at least functioning, when he's around, because he's spinning those plates on that, on that pole, right? And then he has to go all the way over to the left side of the stage, because those plates are starting to wobble out of control, and he goes over there and fixes them. He's a plate spinner. And back in France, de Mont and Champlain managed to acquire titles and monopoly for another character, a guy by the name of Charles de Bourbon, who, of course, was a prince of the blood, very close to the throne himself, very well connected, and whose legitimacy to these titles would be beyond dispute. Champlain and Dumont, of course, being subsidiaries of de Bourbon's operations. Many historians think that uh, the de Bourbon family was more or less indifferent, and they just kind of let Dumont and Champlain run the show. This company, either by Champlain's design or Dumont, because they're both going to take credit for it, uh, also incorporated all these rival factions, and it gave them the ability to buy into the monopoly, buy into the entire setup, which is something they've been trying to do for almost a decade now, is to unify everybody under the same rights and privileges. And since he was a prince of the blood, 
so very well connected. They were able to acquire for him a 12-year monopoly, which is a wonderfully long time, considering how short the monopolies were for de Mont. Charles was to become viceroy of New France, on top of already being the governor of Normandy, a close relative of the king. And in this very short time period, he also dies. So just as Champlain started to piece everything together with his associates, Charles de Bourbon drops dead. And then very quickly, they get everything passed on to his nephew, Henri de Bourbon. So we're back in it. We're back in it. It's all back together now. Again, a few choice individuals spinning those plates when everything else is just falling down around them. The historian Samuel Elliot Morrison says that de Mont was going to use Henri de Bourbon as a figurehead. As important as New France might seem to you because you're listening to this, New France was, well, in the previous century, a joke to the people in France. A symbol of failure and remoteness and desolation. And so Henri de Bourbon had other things to care about. If de Mont could just take a load off for him, that would be to his benefit. And Champlain and de Mont would be able to do what they wanted. So I think there's some uh, credence to this theory. But Champlain's work wasn't done. He stays in France for a while here, 1611 into 1612. One thing he starts to do is to drum up interest in New France with different Catholic orders. Because you have this large population of natives who have never been exposed to the teachings of Jesus Christ, have never been exposed to the Catholic Church. There were souls to be saved. This was a new angle Champlain was playing. Not to say that Champlain was just a salesman for New France, because he actually was a deeply religious Catholic man. And Champlain did drum up some interest. Certain orders started to question whether or not they should plant some missions. Uh, Isaac de Razzoli, around 1612, had a failed mission in the Amazon, and now he was looking for a place to invest. He invests in the Prince's Company. And Razzoli would be a, a great supporter of Champlain for decades to come. So keep him in mind. Champlain manages to get himself appointed lieutenant to the Viceroy of New France. And so when Champlain was in New France and the Viceroy wasn't, which he, of course, never visited, he was, for all intents and purposes, uh, the Viceroy himself. And in this position, while still in France, he made a public awareness campaign to say, hey, we have control of this area. This is ours. We own the monopoly. If you want to trade in the St. Lawrence, you either have to invest in the company or purchase some sort of license from us. The biggest pushback, of course, came from the port city of Saint-Malo, where Jacques Cartier was from. And here we are going on almost 100 years after uh, Jacques Cartier's voyages to the New World, and his community is still uh, a huge chunk of the traffic in and out of the St. Lawrence, legal or not. And he was able to drag many of these merchants into the company, which by 1613 was called in English the Company of Canada. However, the dead Charles de Bourbon had also sold separate licenses to trading in the St. Lawrence, mostly traders out of La Rochelle, and Champlain would have to deal with that in time. Now, when the deal struck for a monopoly with the crown, the Company of Canada would have to provide a thousand crowns a year to develop the colony, in other words, to build structures, plant six families, literally plant six families as colonists a season, and provide one high-bred horse to the Viceroy himself. Of course, from this point forward, a lot of these promises aren't going to happen. Many of these companies that receive grants from the Crown uh, that were required to plant colonists, and they never live up to the expectation. They never live up to the requirement, and that's always part of the reason why uh, their rights become undone. But this new company allows all the old investors, many Protestant in inclination, to participate in the new company under the guise of this very Catholic, very prominent prince who owns the whole kit and caboodle. And in this very same year, 1613, Champlain publishes another book on New France, makes a little revenue for himself, a little more interest in the company. This is also the year that Champlain insists that his wife, Helene, moves out of her family's place and moves in with him. Of course, she being 14, 15 at this time, refuses and runs away from home. Her family disowns her, and all the access that she would have to any sort of estate and money and support. And eventually Helene comes crawling back to her family and is forced by situation to live with Champlain. Perhaps fortunately for her, Champlain wasn't long for France and was looking to return to New France, especially after he ran into a guy in Paris 
who he thought was thousands of miles away in the middle of the North American continent. He runs into a young man named Nicolas de Vigneau, who in 1611 Champlain had given to an Algonquian group to be a young male interpreter, learn their language and their ways and their customs, and help facilitate the trade uh, to his settlement at Quebec. Somehow, uh, although last seeing him in the wilderness of New France, here he was in Paris. And he spoke to Champlain of a great sea to the north of where he had been given over to the Algonquin, only like 16, 17 days walk away. And off this great sea, he found a shipwreck that the natives were talking about. And there was a young English boy there. Of course, going around the circles of all the mariners at all the ports was the tale of Henry Hudson, who had not long before been abandoned by his crew, who mutinied, of course, left him in a small rowboat with him and his son and sailed back home, leaving him in what is now called Hudson's Bay. This coincidence led Champlain to consider that this might actually be true and that de Vigneau had indeed found the final resting place of Henry Hudson and had found an overland route to a northern sea, which might lead, of course, to a northwest passage to China and other parts of Asia. This would be great news for Champlain and for the Company of Canada. And so having run into de Vigneau in March of 1613, by the end of April, he was back in Tadoussac, of course, along the St. Lawrence, with de Vigneau in tow. Champlain dead set on having de Vigneau lead him right to this North Sea. And by May, he was heading out into the uncharted wilderness as far as he was concerned, going north and west of Quebec City, having to pass through native lands he'd never seen before and sachems he didn't know so well or not at all. And so along the way, he had to make constant promises of trading relationships and, and uh, future war alliances. The trails were rough. They had to travel around creeks. They had to go around the Long Sioux. At one point, Champlain fell into a rapid while uh, towing a boat by a rope along the shoreline and was only saved by the fact that he was able to wedge himself between two rocks. And along the way, he uh, experienced the dreaded northern mosquito that would infest uh, Alaska today and parts of Canada. So vicious in their short-lived season of activity. They ate Champlain up. It was miserable going. And eventually they made it to the tippy-top of Innu territory, where they're graded by the great chief, Tessouat. Now it turns out, Champlain had already known Tessouat. He had met, met him in a tabagi in 1603. Remember, Champlain's first visit to the St. Lawrence. Boom, that's where he met him. Tessouat remembered him. Champlain remembered Tessouat. And so here we are, getting on in the year. Many days removed from the 16 or 17 days that de Vigneau said it would take to get to the what we now call Hudson's Bay. And Champlain runs into a friend. Champlain says to him, why do you live so far north? This place is miserable. And he says, we live this far north so we could be safe from the Iroquois. Again, if you've been listening to these episodes, the natives are always trying to turn Champlain against the Iroquois. It always comes back to the Iroquois. He then complained of mistreatment down in the St. Lawrence the previous year. As again, all these random French merchant explorers started to show up, not belonging to the company. And so Tessouat was cautious about ever trading that far south again. But Champlain calmed his fears and introduced him to de Vigneau, for whom he supposed would have some knowledge of the Innu culture this far north. And of course, Tessouat recognized de Vigneau. In fact, de Vigneau had stayed in Tessouat's house, perhaps two winters back. Champlain explained to Tessouat that de Vigneau had been to this northern sea and that he had walked through this land of wizards that the Innu always talked about beyond their territory, and that he was looking for permission from Tessouat to go through this land of wizards, perhaps acquire some guides, and get to this North Sea and see it for himself. Tessouat was taken aback, because he had remembered that de Vigneau spent the entire winter in his house, in his dwelling, in his wikiup, his wigwam, whatever it was called. Wikiup being the politically correct term now, and so, no, de Vigneau had never found a North Sea. He hadn't left Tessouat's territory at all and barely left Tessouat's hut. Tessouat and Champlain grilled de Vigneau to reveal the truth of the matter. And de Vigneau crumbled. And he admitted under pressure that finding his way back to France after being there a while, all he wanted to do was return to the New World. And all he had planned to do was eventually evade Champlain's glance, run away, 
and essentially go native. It's recorded that Tesuat and all of his followers surrounded Divinu and in their own language called him a liar and a bunch of other expletives, I imagine. Tesuat suggests to Champlain that this young man, a liar, now a man of ill repute, uh, be killed. Champlain, even after all these hardships of reaching this far spot to the north, refuses to have Devinu killed, but at the same time disowns him completely and says, don't follow me home, in other words. We don't want to see you in the St. Lawrence. You'll just have to live here. And then, of course, the Innu uh, say the same thing. They don't want to have anything to do with him either. After this, we have nothing but rumor, but some sources say that after Champlain left, some of the natives just hit him on the head with a rock and killed him. And with that, a good chunk of Champlain's year, completely wasted, worn out, exhausted, and pissed off, Champlain limps back to France. My sources vary, but it appears that, uh, moving into 1614, this is the actual date that Helene, his wife, moves in with him. And to Champlain's horror, Helene has Huguenot tendencies. Uh, in Champlain's eyes, Helene is a Protestant, and Champlain a devout Catholic. And so we enter another dark chapter in Champlain's marriage, where he somehow re-educates Helene into becoming a devout Catholic like himself. So much so that later in life, she would become a nun. And of course, if you're a modern reader of Champlain's life like myself, you just see the uh, individuality of this young girl, not even a woman, a girl, just slowly, or actually very quickly, being beaten out of her. And just to keep us up on the timeline, Helene, in 1614, would be 16 years old, while Champlain would be into his 40s. And now for the first time in a while, Champlain spends quite a large amount of time in France, at least the majority of the time from the end of 1613 all the way into 1615. In this gap of time that might have been 18 months, we don't hear much about Champlain's doings, which is rare, because in any given year he does three or four amazing things. But in this gap of time, the one thing he manages to do is get the Recollets on board for missionary activities in New France, something that he had first negotiated with them over in 1613. Now, the Recollets were an order of Franciscans, a firmly French institution, unlike the Jesuits, who at this time leaned heavily uh, to the Iberian Peninsula, which is why the Jesuits were often uh, distrusted before the 1620s, 1630s, it's believed that they were the eyes and ears of the Spanish Empire. And so Champlain was probably hesitant to bring in a religious order that had affiliations with the other colonial powers that might have competing claims. However, the Recollets had no such affiliation. And now Champlain could make good on his promises to start converting the natives, the First Nations people. To start saving souls. The Recollets themselves received permission from the Pope to do this, along with the French venture, which the esteemed historian Francis Parkman points out would likely nullify all the papal bulls of 1493 around there that gave away the New World to Portugal and Spain. Here we have a later Pope condoning the conversion of natives to Catholicism under a French regime. By the way, that's the, a super history nerd nitty gritty detail. And if you don't understand it or don't find it interesting, that means you're a normal person and not a guy recording history podcast uh, in his second bedroom next to a litter box. These recollets would be supported, at least partially, by the Company of Canada, therefore making good on their promises to support missionary activities in New France. So on top of something that Champlain was looking to do and something the Recollets wanted to do, it was a contractual obligation that the company needed to fulfill in order to make sure they kept their monopoly. This sounds like a, a quaint matter to you, perhaps, but this is literally a time where business, government, and church were all connected. And you can see it right here. This is the perfect example. An arrangement like this just wouldn't exist today. Four of the Recollets were selected to journey to New France with Champlain. And I'm going to butcher their names, but here we go. Denis Jemay, Jean Daubu, Joseph Le Caron, and a lay brother by the name of Pacific du Plessis. Thank you for tolerating my French, by the way. And probably answering Helene's prayers, now to the Catholic God, not the Protestant God. In May of 1615, Champlain leaves 
for New France with the Recollets and not Helene. They make quick time and make it to Quebec before the end of the month. Le Caron would be assigned to the Huron, while Dolbin was assigned to the Innu. It's thought that the Recollets would do well among the natives. They were known as probably the strictest of the Franciscan orders. These men would be gluttons for punishment, as all Franciscans were, but especially the Recollets. So all the rigors and athleticism required of living a life like a First Nations person from previously living in a small monastery, the Recollets were supposed to be the ones who were uh, most able to accomplish this task. However, if you go back to our first episode in this season, when we talked about the lifestyle of the Innu, it was tough. A tough and proud people. And Dolbu, who went to live among them, lasted less than a year. One thing that really did him in was the winter. Of course, the winter up on the Canadian Shield. He describes living in these squat, short wigwams, packed with people just to stay warm, with a fire in the center and the smoke just filling up the entire enclosure, hugging the ground, trying to sap any sort of warmth out of your neighbor. Day after day, month after month, clinging to life as it were. By the time spring came around, the, the pure, white, snowy landscape and all the smoke had nearly blinded him. And so in spring of 1616, he headed back to France. First boat out of town. The Huron, however, lived a little further south. Lived a lot like the Iroquois we learned about last season. In long houses. They had central hearths. Providing a, a good amount of warmth all throughout. Sedentary lifestyle. A good store of grain that they had grown throughout the year. Corn, of course. Living patterns far more familiar to a Frenchman of the day than anything the Innu were doing. These recollets would do much better, and they would plant the first seeds of Christianity into the Huron culture, and we'll see the, the waves of impact from that later on. Champlain, back at Quebec, was again egged into attacking the Iroquois by his Algonquin and Huron allies. It seems like anytime Champlain has a moment to breathe, the natives come around and they're pushing him into uh, conflicts with the Iroquois. Champlain at this point in 1615 is a little hesitant, but it's Grave Dupont, his good friend and probably mentor for the last 13 years or so, encouraged Champlain to go. And then Champlain resolved for himself that this, this can't just be a raid like he's participated in before. We can't just go in, cause some casualties, and leave. This needs to be a, a decisive, offensive attack that pushes the Iroquois out of the area for a while at least or at least establishes a southern border between the different native groups. Champlain genuinely wanted to break these seasonal patterns of raiding one another that just led to more warfare, because inevitably you just end up in a blood feud. You killed some of my people, I killed some of your people. There's no ending to that. It just will go tit for tat forever. And so Champlain's justification, and the most positive light we can take of him in this scenario, is that he wanted to create a great peace in the area. And the only way to do that was to definitively defeat this one enemy that all his native allies are telling him is the root cause of the problem. Again, if I was recording this podcast 100 years ago on wax, uh, we would look at it from Champlain's point of view as the European in the area. He'd be the one leading and making decisions. It's clear to us now that Champlain is being led by his allies. These aren't uh, French attacks with native allies, as the old books would often say. These are native attacks with French allies. The French aren't in control here. At this point, there's very little French about New France. And it is in preparations for this offensive attack that we see different Algonquian groups getting together. The Huron, the French, they're all talking to one another. And another character comes back from the mists of our story. Antony Bruel. Bruel. Antony Bruel. <laughs> who was sent to the Huron some years before by Champlain to learn their language and to facilitate the fur trade from them to the French. Champlain had not seen him in a while, but the Huron seemed to like him quite a bit, and he had quickly picked up on the native languages. He was a bright young man. So Champlain decided that he was willing to send Bruel off with a group of Huron, who were going to travel far to the south, south of the Iroquois Confederation, in fact, to these far distant allies that might be able to join the Huron and the Algonquins, Algonquians uh, for an attack. Now, this group is believed to be the Susquehanna, or the Susquehannock, 
another Iroquois-speaking group, who were not in the Iroquois Confederacy. And the plan now was to strike at the heart of the Iroquois Confederacy, not at the Seneca, the western door, or the Mohawk, the eastern door, but the, the innards of the longhouse, the inner rooms. In fact, most historians, not all, uh, believe today the village that Champlain and his allies ended up attacking was none other than Onondaga, the singular and titular village of the Onondaga people, and the seat of the great council of the whole Haudenosaunee uh, confederation, the whole Iroquois confederation. This is where they would meet. Champlain was about to attack their Washington, D.C. One wonders if Champlain, because of his previous successes, felt the tension of this new attack, really understood the ramifications of not hitting the periphery, but going right for the center of the power of this large and dangerous confederation. And Champlain certainly seems to begin to doubt his own native allies upon entering just the edge of Onondaga country. One of the Huron allies of the Petite Nation seizes a woman, an Onondaga woman, who of course was nowhere near her village, perhaps gathering foraging, laying traps for game, who knows? But they find a single woman. They seize her. And Champlain watches as they cut off her finger. This, of course, might be the beginning of many tortures. Champlain stops them, and he warns them. He says, we do, in my country, we do not do uh, things like this to women. And if you continue to do this kind of thing, we're out of here. We're done. We will not participate in this attack. But of course, we know better now that the natives were really in control of this situation. And what the natives did next to demonstrate that to Champlain is that they took her child and they smashed him against a tree head first until that child's brains were spilled on the earth. Now Champlain must be worried. Nevertheless, he still believes on some level when it comes to attacking Onondaga, he's going to have some say in how it's done. Champlain sits with his allies, and his plan is to have the native allies draw out the Onondaga force from behind the palisades. The entire village, of course, protected by this palisade all around the perimeter. He was going to draw out the Onondaga force to face the native force, and then the French would come in and surprise them with their guns and their strange looks and strange armor. It had worked before. I believe 1609 and 1610, but it had been a number of years, and unbeknownst to Champlain, the Iroquois were getting used to gunpowder. They are getting used to guns and white people and metal. The shock factor wasn't going to be there this time. The Iroquois had learned. And at Onondaga, the native allies, they didn't try to draw out the Onondaga. They immediately attacked the Palisades, tried to scale it, were fought back, casualties mounting on both sides. It looked like chaos to the French eye. And so the French fired off their guns, and both sides scattered. Nothing was going as planned. Champlain gets a closer look at Onondaga, and this is our first written account of what this, uh, this remarkable, amazing, important place looked like. It had four rows of Palisades, 30 feet high, with walkways on top. Uh, where s stones were being stored to be thrown at any attackers, along with a sluice, a canal system of sorts, that brought water right into the village. This wasn't a makeshift fort uh, near Ticonderoga or near the Richelieu River. In the native world at this time, it was a formidable fortification. How would you ever get through one of these? But in Champlain's mind, he had seen stuff like this before. This was essentially a wooden castle. And he knew how castles were scaled with the Onondaga back behind their palisades. And the natives with Champlain now backing off, each side regrouping. It became clear that these allies from the south, being directed by the Huron and Antony Bruel, were not showing up. Where have they gone? It didn't look like they were coming in anytime soon. Champlain had the Algonquian allies and the Huron allies make wooden shields something to protect themselves from the arrows and the spears that would be thrown. And then he created a platform with levels, as tall as the Iroquois Palisade, where he could put his gunmen up on top 
and have them fire straight at the top of the palisade to the men on top with the rocks and God knows what else. And then this structure could be moved and pushed square against the palisade, now cleared of the Iroquois, allowing his allies to scale over the top of it. All of this, of course, would require a level of military discipline that the natives at this time did not have. In Europe, being part of the military was giving up a little bit of your liberty, a little bit of your free will, being part of a unit. There was strength in the unit, but you gave up your individuality. The native warriors were individuals. It was their conscience and their conscience alone that decided whether or not they were to go to war. And in competing in that war and actually going through with it, again, they could be persuaded to participate in a strategy, but ultimately what they wanted to do was what they were going to do. And so despite Champlain's best laid plans, he essentially had planned them out for uh, European military men. The two, the two systems didn't work out this time. They attacked Onondaga again. Massive losses. The natives again go back to just trying to scale the palisades. Champlain is shot twice with arrows. At least one in the leg, which he's going to need to get back to Quebec. And the entire force decides to retreat. Champlain sees this as a massive loss. Although uh, historian Bruce Trigger and others mentioned that in the native view... This was a very successful and aggressive attack on Onondaga. It was a raid, which Champlain would feel none of this victory. And as miserable as all of this was, trying to get back to any sort of safety uh, with an injured leg was, even in his words, perhaps the worst memory of his life. And at this point, I'll, I'll quote the man himself. He says, I was never in such torment in my life, for the pain of the wound was nothing to that of being bound and pinioned against the back of one of our savages. I lost patience, and as soon as I could bear my weight, I got out of this prison, or rather out of this hell. What the natives had done for him, and this is only because of his uh, previous military exploits and the cherished trade with the French that they did this, they stuffed him in a basket, more or less, and then they just tied him to a really big dude. And Champlain was carried like a baby uh, to safety. And so the pain that Champlain talks about may not have been so much physical as just psychological, just pure embarrassment. In the last two attacks on the Iroquois, he was their Luke Skywalker. He came in at the end of, you know, Mandalorian season two. Sorry to ruin it for you. It saves the day. Now he's as good as a crate of oranges to make matters worse. The Huron were not willing to bring him back to Quebec. Champlain was headed towards Huronia, and he would have to spend all winter there. Historians think that the Huron, anticipating uh, Iroquois counterattacks, wanted the Frenchmen, the few that there were, with firearms, to be in their villages over winter. Or maybe a related explanation would be that the Huron simply didn't want to uh, take any more time in the St. Lawrence than they needed to, seeing as the Iroquois could get to the St. Lawrence a hell of a lot easier than they could get to Huronia. Either way, there was a sense of, oh no, we just hit their capital. We just hit a a very important spot in their confederacy. Let's get out of here. And so Champlain would be guest of the Huron, or perhaps captive. I'll let you decide. Let's talk about his experience over that winter. The historian David Hackett Fisher, who I can't stop talking about, he says of this uh, winter period, Champlain's impression of the Huron was in many ways very positive. He greatly admired their agriculture and huge fisheries, marveled at their skill in hunting, and come to form a high respect for their woodcraft. As before with many other nations, he found these Indians to be equal of Europeans in intelligence and superior in physical strength. Champlain recognized, especially with the Huron, who were sedentary, much like the French, that uh, they just lacked the level of technology the French had, but they had all the same abilities and capabilities as anyone he grew up around. And you must remember, and I know this sounds odd because you you think of racist thoughts and uh, racial theories as being very old-fashioned. This is older than that old-fashioned. The the idea of race theory does not quite exist yet. It's emerging. But he lives in a time before all of those antiquated thoughts even exist. That's how long ago this was. At some point... Champlain writes that he visited the Huron capital 
or at least what he believed to be the capital. And he said that it had three to 6,000 inhabitants. Quite a wide range there, but three to 6,000 inhabitants and uh, seven rows of palisades. That would make this one settlement grander than Onondaga that he just attacked. And by his own estimate, he said that all the various tribes in the Huron Confederation probably numbered somewhere around 32,000 individuals in total membership, so to speak, which may have made it larger than the Iroquois Confederacy in population, and in the very least, close to equal with the Iroquois. Champlain, again, is very impressed with the huge fields of corn. It seemingly went on for miles. Again, the Huron were the granary of the Algonquian people to the north, whereas traditionally these people, like some of the Innu, might come to the Huron with large moose hides and trade them for uh, winter corn. Now the Huron were able to use the corn as a uh, means of exchange in order to get those other furs, like beaver, to the French. And they could always sweeten the deal with a couple European goods along the way. This gave them a distinct advantage over the Innu and other people, uh, usually of the Algonquian background, because agriculture wasn't quite as important to them. So that was just one less good that they would have had at their disposal. The Huron were in the right place, at the right time, with the right skills to command the fur trade. On that note, Champlain wanted to visit other places over the winter. Because he's always, he's restless. He always wants to be doing something. And he wanted to visit the neutral nation. Which is a, a nation of another Iroquois, Iroquoian-speaking people who didn't belong to the Iroquois Confederacy. They didn't belong to the Huron. They were literally neutral, and that's why we call them that. Among other names, they decided not to take sides. The Huron, of course, refuse. Because Champlain is their customer. He is a monosopy. He controls all the demand for the fur trade. They can't let him go. They can't let him meet new people. In fact, the Huron are very well aware that they have just gone around the Innu to become the suppliers themselves. It's curious that over this winter, he uh, mentions that the women are fair. They're attractive. Because so much of Champlain is not sexual at all. He doesn't really appear to... That's not part of his life. He's a busy man. He has lots of things to do. That seems to be uh, something he gives no time to, uh, especially concerning his marriage, as we've talked about before on this podcast, and probably right inside of this episode, if I uh, could remember the things that, that come out of my mouth. Uh, his relationship with his young wife, people debate whether it was sexual at all. It may never have been consummated. And here he is mentioning that her on women are attractive. Just an interesting thing. Because the modern mind might question whether Samuel D. Champlain was homosexual or just asexual altogether. The real answer is obscured by time and culture and ultimately unanswerable. So I'm not going to dwell on it anymore. Well, who am I kidding? I'm probably going to bring it up in the next episode. But just to segue to a, another event that happened to him over the winter, a Huron woman propositions him for sex. Champlain at least records that he refused. It doesn't appear as if he was having any relations inside of his Catholic marriage. He certainly wouldn't have any outside of it. Historians suspect that over this period of time, he made an alliance with the Huron. Although Champlain's own account doesn't seem to record that. And it seems likely that this was one of those uh, cultural misunderstandings. Where the Huron understood that they made a firm alliance, Champlain wasn't really aware of it. Again, even though they're living in the same time and spending time together, the cultures are still... Far apart, very far apart. But like the Innu, who were his previous source of furs primarily, he still buys furs from them, one clan of the Innu would control trade going to Champlain. Now there'd be one clan of the Huron, inside of one tribe of the Huron, supplying furs to Champlain. So despite being in a confederacy, not everything was shared. And this is very similar to the Iroquois Confederacy, where the Mohawk, and a specific clan or two of the Mohawk, controlled access to Fort Orange among the Dutch. Champlain records in very vague terms the politics of the Huron as best he can understand it, which we've already established is not terribly well. He mentions that they have 50 chiefs. They have a big grand council of 50 chiefs, which is exactly like their neighbors to the east, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy. There's a lot of similarities here, which, not to spoil the fun, will be the reason why the Huron will be such a perfect target and favored target of the Iroquois. Because their captives captives would just fit in so well. It didn't take very much to get them up to speed with everybody else. It's like if we went up to uh, Canada, took some folks, brought them down here. Wouldn't take very long before they blended in. Despite all the positives, at the end of the winter, Champlain concluded 
that a Huron lifestyle was just wretched to him. It, it was not up to his standards. Um, different French writers, they would describe the Huron women eating fleas off of their children. And this, there was just something instinctively revolting about that to the Frenchmen. Champlain also concluded that these Huron, they're great folks, they look pretty, they're good people to trade with, good people to war with, but they worship the devil. An important thing to know, um, because it doesn't really apply to modern Catholics, but a couple hundred years ago, if you were Catholic, of course you believed in the Christian God, but other people who believed in other gods, whereas today we'd go, well, your gods don't exist, my God does. Back then, uh, many people said, no, 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 those beings do exist. You're just worshiping demons, or you're worshiping the devil, or some trick of the devil. It wasn't that you were in error. It was that you were in league with Satan. And this goes all the way back. I believe that the term demon literally derives from the Greek word for their own gods, like demonos or something like that. I could be completely wrong on that. If I am, email me. Don't ding me a star on an Apple review or something. Anyway, I'm rambling. Spring comes. Champlain makes his way back to Quebec. He's first spotted by the French in May of 1616 at the Lachine Rapids. Pontgrave and everybody else in Quebec thought he was dead. Think about it. He went to war and he's been gone for like eight months. He's dead. And although they're happy to see him, there's rumblings from back in France. Pontgrave and Champlain are going to have to go back as soon as they can. And so they had to leave their little chunk of New France, which in 1616 consisted of Quebec, a trading post at Montreal, Tadoussac, of course, the Innu place of trading, and Three Rivers. Yes, I'm using the English term. When the two of them returned to France, they learned that their boss, the Viceroy of New France, has been imprisoned, losing, of course, all of his privileges, and Champlain has been fired. Once again, the plates have fallen, everything is in disarray, and it's up to Champlain to slowly start rebuilding things. Of course, the Company of Canada were of no help. And in fact, part of Champlain's firing was probably due to investors who didn't care for him. Because Champlain would hold investors to uh, building up the colony, providing colonists as they promised, providing for fortifications as they promised, uh, furnishing supplies as they promised. Investors didn't want to do that. They wanted to buy into the company and immediately start gaining profit. They didn't want to keep paying into it. So on the French side of things, uh, when it came to the merchants and the money lenders and the businessmen, they didn't like Champlain. But boy, Champlain was convincing. By January of 1617, he finds the guy who gets the new monopoly over the fur trade, the new viceroyalty of New France, a guy named Pons, and he gets his old job back. He becomes the lieutenant to the viceroy, or the lieutenant viceroy. That's a very veiled office joke. And if you got it, props to you. But then wouldn't you know it, here we are, 1617, he rushes back to New France, back to Quebec, only to find that two Frenchmen had been killed by a couple Innu. This wasn't a war party. This wasn't a declaration of war. This wasn't aggression between nations. This was a small scuffle that got out of control, and some Frenchmen were killed. But blood was shed. And in the Indian world, the Native American world, the First Nations world, especially in the Northeast, this would lead to a blood feud. You have spilled our blood, we will spill your blood in retribution. And so the Innu just assumed that the French would go on the warpath. And so they gathered 800 warriors together and resolved that if need be, they would wipe the French square off the continent. Of course, all this happens while Champlain is away. And then the two sides are at a standoff. At one point, a faction of the natives, they offer compensation, which is also a, a native way of resolving disputes. Blood has been shed on your side. We will give you so much wampum or so much of a certain possession to make up for the loss, or at least as a gesture of our, our guilt and our remorse. But the French aren't buying it. Finally, the guilty natives the couple guys that there were, surrendered themselves to the French. And of course, many of the Frenchmen immediately wanted to kill them. But it was the Recollet father who reminded them of how important it was that you don't kill them. 
how tense the situation is, and the hundreds of natives who would come descending upon all the French settlements if we did execute them. It was decided to wait for Champlain to come back, and that's the, the mess he stepped in, essentially. Champlain took a long while to decide what to do in this scenario. Ultimately, he took the path of forgiveness. He forgave the natives. They were not executed. Despite all the Frenchmen who wanted them dead, Champlain absolved them. Champlain used this as a moment to make new agreements with the Innu, and then some of the members of the murderers' families, I'm, I'm pluralizing both of those terms, were to join the French as more or less captives, but more like an insurance policy, which was also a native custom. So they would be taken in by the Recollect Fathers and taught the Christian ways. So again, another opportunity to bind these two people together just as they seem to have been torn apart. Champlain's a very smart man. And had this been New England at the time, the Puritans would have had a very different reaction. We'll learn about that next season. All of that being settled, Champlain, before the end of the year, finds his way back in France, 1617. And over that winter into 1618, he's traveling through all the influential circles because he's pitching his idea for a grand new France full of French people and not just a series of profitable trading posts that all these companies he's had to deal with uh, would have preferred. He goes to the Chamber of Commerce in Paris, gives them the whole plan. They give him lip service. Then they kick the issue up to the king. He goes and meets with the king. And he even tells him that he still believes there could be a passageway through the St. Lawrence to get to China. Now, I'm skeptical at this point. because Champlain hasn't been looking for a northwest or a western passage or an overland route with a, with a very short distance between bodies of water. He hasn't been looking for that. He seemingly has given up on that, but he threw that one out there. The king merely advised him to keep trying to work with the Company of Canada. The son, of course, not finding Champlain as charming as his father, Henri IV, and contributed nothing to Champlain's endeavors. And, of course, the Company of Canada hears about all these wild schemes. And as far as his position in the company was concerned, he was fired and demoted to explorer. So while he might have a position with the viceroy, a government position, his position in the company was explorer. A huge insult to a great man. But the title does not seem to have changed his role in the actual on-the-ground functions of Quebec and the other trading outposts in New France. And so, sometime in 1618, he's back. Very few men at this time cross back and forth across the Atlantic as much as Champlain. Well, once back in the New World, Champlain finally runs into Antony Bruel, or Antony Bruel, whatever, however you want to say it, runs into that young man who was supposed to go get those southern allies to attack the Iroquois a number of years before. He'd been gone. Champlain figured him dead, just as everyone figured Champlain dead. It turns out everything went awry on his mission uh, to the south. And just by accident, the young man ended up traversing a huge swath of territory that would now be New York State and Pennsylvania. And in fact, the New York State Department of Education, in a publication from quite a few decades ago, credits Bruel with being the first European to see a huge swath of New York State. Probably at least the western chunk and the southern tier, as we call it. So in addition to his unrecorded travels among the Great Lakes, because he didn't write any of this down, he had also seen many of what we would have called the middle colonies a hundred years from the, this point in our timeline. It's believed that he interacted with many tribes who had never seen a white man. He, he was so far literally off the maps that he was a novelty. And as Champlain learned from the Huron a couple winters before, Bruel was known to do a, quite a lot of exploring of the native women. So understandably, Champlain was a little angry at the young man. Where, where were you? We were going to battle. We kind of lost that battle. Could have used your help. Where have you been? As any young man who gets in trouble does, he goes on a long-winded explanation. Some of the highlights were that he gets separated from his group, and eventually he's trying to travel his way back north, and he's caught by a group of Seneca. And the reason he's caught by them is because they see him in the far distance. They shout out to him. And to his ear, they sound like the Huron, the allies that he left with. And 
the Seneca language is extremely close to the Huron language that Antony Brule, who had lived with them with several, for several years, could not distinguish between them. So he unknowingly just walked right up to the enemy, who, of course, seized him and questioned who he was and determined that he was indeed a Frenchman, which, as you can imagine, by the third time Champlain had attacked the Iroquois, being a Frenchman would uh, not be a good thing to be in Seneca territory. He describes that they tied him to a tree and lit a fire and were, were beginning to do their slow tortures that they were famous for, slowly stripping off the clothes, taking out the implements of destruction. At this point, they would start taking out bits of flesh, just the smallest little tortures. But, according to Antony Brule, and you can take this with any size grain of salt you want, his cross, his Catholic cross that he had hanging around his neck, it glinted in the sun, and the natives pointed at it, and they, they wanted to know what it was. And he said, no, 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 you better not hurt me. Don't hurt me, and don't hurt, don't hurt my necklace. This is the necklace of a vengeful God, and any damage to me will be visited upon you. And then, according to him, a great storm came rolling in just at that moment, and the natives along with Bruel, both knew what that meant. It was God's vengeance rolling across the hills, coming to the Iroquois who would dare touch a Catholic man. At this, Bruel was let go and found his way back to the French. It's doubtful that Champlain believed every bit of that story, no matter how he wrote it down. But he seemed to have pitied the boy, and so he said, fine, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Let's get you back to work. This is one of the few periods in Champlain's life that he didn't seem to record much of his day-to-day -day in a journal or diary of any sort. And that's because he was just darting back and forth between France and New France, deals falling apart on both sides. Again, at times he seems to be the only competent person. But then he's also the primary source, so of course he would make himself out to be the competent one in this scenario. But before the end of the decade... The 16 teens, the formerly imprisoned de Bourbon, is released from prison. He regains his viceroyalty. He makes Champlain his lieutenant again. The Company of Canada keeps trying to downgrade Champlain. And at a certain point, this new king gives Champlain a new pension, the last one having expired when the old king died. And it is known that the king of France himself had to tell investors, listen, this is Samuel D. Champlain. He's done a lot of work. He's a smart guy. Listen to his designs. And in case you forgot, he's one of my employees. To sum up this period from about 1610 to 1620, the government and business connection uh, that, as you can see, is falling apart will withstand the decade, but not, not very much past it. Changes are in the works. But for Champlain, on a personal level, there's a lot of change coming his way. As we move into 1620, his young wife, Helene, will be traveling to New France with him. Certainly a turning point for the two of them, but also for New France as a whole. When women and children begin showing up in any colonial endeavor, that's a sign that some power that be considers the place stable, ready for growth, ready for whatever they consider civilization to take root. Get ready for some changes. First of which will be the end of this episode. I'm Eric Giannis. This is the Other States of America History Podcast. Thank you for listening.